Hey y'all, my name is Jory and I'm the Black Medical Anthropologist. Today I'm going to be doing a get ready with me and I'm going to be telling stories that led me to become a medical anthropologist and what turned me off from being a psychiatrist. As I've mentioned in previous videos, I went to medical school and decided not to go to residency. So this video will be telling some stories that helped me come to the conclusion that I did not want to be a psychiatrist and I instead wanted to be a medical anthropologist. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Now let's get right into it. So in medical school, I originally wanted to be an OBGYN, but then after I had my psychiatry rotation, I decided that I really enjoyed it. Only 2% of psychiatrists are black, and so I was like, I want to contribute to that percentage. After doing two rotations in psychiatry, I realized that it had some flaws that I didn't appreciate. One of the biggest deterrents to psychiatry was that I felt like I, I couldn't trust the medications. I didn't think the field was completely lost, but I wanted to practice psychiatry in a way that I would be having my patients on medication for a very short period of time. And on top of me having those thoughts, I was in the basement studying for my step exam and this man who was like touring the building because his son was about to go to school nearby and he was like asking me like oh do you like this building and I was like yeah we got to talking and I was telling him how I was interested in psychiatry and he was like oh I actually train psychiatrists on the west coast because I'm a PhD I'm a psychologist and we started ch chatting about like my perspective and like he was just like looking at me with this kind of like strange look honestly um and he said you know your ideas in psychiatry are very taboo and you're gonna need a community and he told me that he was a pioneer who advocated for the black box warning about SSRIs um, causing suicidal ideation in children he was basically somebody who advocated really, really strongly for that, for that to actually be implemented. He didn't really trust a lot of psychiatric medications and that that was the best that he could do. But in reality, SSRIs causes an increase in suicidal ideation for adults too. They couldn't get that label on because of politics. Having it for children was the best that he could do at that time. So I was really fascinated by that um, when he told me that I was going to need a community because my thoughts were taboo I was like a little alarmed he told me that he had even like hosted events for people who had been fired for having like more taboo and like similar beliefs to me so yeah I was just like okay noted and I felt like what he said rung true because anytime I was like bringing up the cultural aspects of of psychiatry or my um hesitation to believe in the drugs I was often met with denial from classmates um, I was met with judgment and so I was just like oh wow like what he said rings true like I'm already seeing this happen. That kind of turned me off from psychiatry because I don't like being in spaces where I'm not welcomed. I don't like being in spaces where I'm not nurtured. Um, I don't like feeling like an outsider as a black woman. I already feel that way in a lot of spaces. When I realized that psychiatry was a lot about medicine management um, and less about the things that I cared about that were more like anthropological, I was turned off from the field. So that situation with him in the basement was definitely put into consideration when I was thinking about whether or not I wanted to go into psychiatry. At that point, like I was still very passionate about mental health, but I didn't really know what to do. I had gone through my first rotation where I experienced a very strange phenomena. So I had this one black patient who was a refugee and she was escaping her country in war. Ultimately, I was consulted on her in my psychiatry rotation because she had tried to, to kill herself and they gave her a sitter, but they were they wanted us to evaluate, you know, what exactly was going on with her and did she actually still need the sitter? So I went to go talk to her before my attending did because that's typically what medical students do. I'm talking to her and she's telling me about all this trauma that she experienced and how she's experienced trafficking, um, abuse, and sex used by her father and fathered her or and mothered huh? and how she birthed multiple children by him and then how she fled the country and like all this violence that she went through and as she's telling me this she's getting worked up um and like I'm affirming her and she said that the reason why she was in the hospital right now was because she has a terminal chronic illness. Something happened in her apartment, like she lived in public housing and something happened in her in her apartment 
that caused her to lose her life-saving medication. So she had to go to the hospital instead. Her illness like gave her a very short life expectancy. And so she's telling me about all these things. And then eventually she like starts to like hyperventilate. She starts reaching for her nasal cannula, which is like what we put like for people who have oxygen. She starts reaching for that and she starts trying to tighten it around her neck and kill herself. As a provider, you're not allowed to touch the patient. So I was kind of panicked, honestly. I was with the resident, thank God, or I think the resident came in, I'm not sure. But regardless, I wasn't alone and somebody called a code so that we can get security. So while we're waiting on security, my, my resident actually suggested that um, we play music to help calm her down. She requested the song Better by Jessica Reedy. So we start playing that song. I start playing it from my phone and she calms down. Like she starts to like, her breathing slows down and she starts to sigh and cry and praise God. Also asking God, why does this have to happen to me? It was really sad, but eventually she let go of the nasal cannula and we were able to keep her safe. After she calmed down, I, I went to go talk to my attending. And when we came back, she had no recollection of what had happened. We decided that she had a dissociative episode. During her time in the hospital, she had multiple stressors at home that led to her having multiple dissociative episodes in which she tried to kill herself in the same manner as before. We were able to snap her out of it by using gospel music. And so that was just very powerful to me. She also would talk about talking to spirits in the cemetery and how that calmed her down. And in a typical case like that, like somebody may have diagnosed her with like schizophrenia or, an, or another psych psychotic disorder. But because of her trauma, we thought it was more of a PTSD picture, especially with the dissociative episodes. And that was just very fascinating to me, like the cross section of spirituality and religion and like how for some cultures, like you may think of it as like psychotic, but for other cultures, you may not. That was a very fascinating situation that I was in that like made me put on my anthropology brain and like think from a more cultural perspective. But I felt like that needed to be honed in on more in psychiatry instead of medication management. As much as that aspect fascinated me, it wasn't necessarily like the biggest part of my job as a psychiatrist if I were to go into the field. So that also raised, raised alarms for me that like, maybe I'm not meant to be a psychiatrist. Maybe I'm meant to do something else. That was one instance where religion and culture played a role in psychiatry. Throughout her stay, I gave her bedside therapy. We did do some medication management and played gospel music and also helped with some of the stressors that she had at home. Cause like, that's also a very big contributor to mental health. And eventually she was sent home she wasn't having a dissociative episodes by the time she was discharged. So that was one instance and I felt like, I felt kind of excited to utilize religion and culture in healthcare because I'm an anthropologist. So I was looking forward to an, another opportunity to utilize those things. That opportunity came when we had this man who came in the ED. He had come to the ED like emergency department. He had come through the emergency department like four times that week and each time he was extremely anxious but would repeat over and over I don't know I don't know and like there was nothing medically wrong with him and then he didn't want to go to the like psychiatric unit there wasn't really much we could do so because of that like we just sent him home but he kept coming back I hadn't seen him for the couple days prior but there was one day that he was my patient when I was con like in consulting psychiatric consulting. So that means that you consult on patients in the hospital who have psychiatric concerns, but are being treated medically for something. So I am consulted and I go talk to him. At this point, a psychiatric resident had convinced him to come to at least the medical floor to get checked out more thoroughly. And that's what they did. They checked him out more thoroughly. He's elderly. So we ruled out things that would cause delirium, like having a urinary tract infection. So at that point I had decided like, my goal was to, to assess whether or not he needed to be admitted to our voluntary psychiatric unit. So I go to interview him and he's doing the same thing that I had read about him doing, which was perseverating about how anxious he was. I get a thorough history. I learn a lot about him and I come up with a couple of diagnoses that I think that he might have. But ultimately, I wanted to admit him to the unit so that we could do a more thorough evaluation of what was going on with him mentally. 
was very scared to go to the unit. He wanted to kind of talk with his mom to help him make the decision, but ultimately even her input wasn't helpful to him. He still felt like he wasn't sure if he wanted to go to the psychiatric unit. I asked him, are you religious? And that was the only time I saw him have any level of certainty. Um, <laughs> he said with so much certainty, yes, I'm very religious, aren't you? Um, and so I, I saw that as a window of opportunity and I asked him, have you consulted God about going to the psychiatric unit? And he looked so perplexed and I looked, it looked like I had caught him completely off guard and he just looked stunned and didn't say anything for a second. And eventually he said, no, I actually haven't. I told him, well, maybe you should, maybe you should consult God and see if you want to go to the psychiatric unit. So I left him to talk with God and pray, and it wasn't very long after that that he called us and told us that he wanted to go, wanted to be admitted to the psychiatric unit. I didn't ask for, you know, I didn't want him to backtrack because he was very back and forth. So I didn't want him to backtrack and like make him second guess himself. So I didn't ask him what helped him come to that decision, but I'm sure it had to do with me telling him to consult with God. And so that was just further confirmation for me we need to be honing in on religion a lot more than we are. And in actuality, a lot of the times religion is used to pathologize in psychiatry. For instance, I had another patient who we diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but I wasn't very, I wasn't necessarily sold on the diagnosis because one of the things that we used to decide that he had a mania was that he was saying that God had given him a second chance. He had a near-death experience and we had consulted on him after he had become um, aggressive with the with the staff. When we went to go talk to him, one of the things that the resident I was with used to affirm that he had bipolar disorder was that he was saying that God had given him a second chance and that like he was so grateful and um, God had spoken to him. And I, t I, I explained to the resident that like, with black Americans, we have a very connected relationship with God. Like it's not uncommon for a black American person to say that they talk to God directly. Um, a lot of Protestant Christian people feel that way. It's not uncommon. Um, but that was still, that along with other things contributed to him being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And I don't know, to this day, I'm still not certain how I feel about him being diagnosed with that. I was grateful that he had a team that knew him well, a psychiatric and mental health team that knew him well outside of the page of the hospital. So I knew that like, even if we were wrong, like he would likely be followed up with and they could catch it and change his medication if necessary. I think it's more common in psychiatry to pathologize somebody's religious beliefs and, and rightfully so. There are things like OCD compulsions um, around prayer and consulting God and things that you would label as pathological. I'm like, I'm not doubting that at all. Um, I definitely think in some ways religion can be in corp it can be associated with mental illness, unfortunately, but in other ways it can be a protective factor. And while psychiatry acknowledges that it's a protective factor, it doesn't necessarily um, use that to our advantage. It's just kind of like, oh, if this patient is religious, then they'd likely be turning to prayer and other you know, support systems within religion. But in my experience, I just felt like we weren't doing enough with that information. Because we weren't doing enough, I felt more like an anthropologist. Like I was not focused on medication or diagnosing. And that was like a lot of what psychiatry was, at least like the way that I experienced it. I knew there were other ways that you could help treat patients, but I knew that they were considered more taboo because of course they had less studies behind them because they're not funded by drug companies. And even when I was looking up psychiatry residencies, like there would be some residency programs that focused a lot on therapy as opposed to medication management. Overall, I felt like there wasn't enough talk of culture and racial influences in mental health and like clearing up like, oh, this is how psychosis would look in the black American community versus like a white American or an Asian American. It's just like, it was just very surface level. And I didn't feel comfortable practicing in a field like that when I was seeing religious experiences firsthand that were contributing to people's better mental health. 
I felt like instead of being a psychiatrist, I should look into that more basically. And so that's what led me to be a medical anthropologist. I care about people getting better, but I care about people getting better from a less medication oriented lens. And I feel like in order to do that, you have to put on an anthropology cap and look at it from an anthropological lens. There are psychiatrists who are both anthropologists and psychiatrists, but I just felt like the more I drank the Kool-Aid, the less likely I would be making an impact in the way that I would want to. So I'm not saying that I will never pursue a psychiatry residency, but I felt like I had to go through anthropology first um, to feel confident in doing the things that I already knew were tr like worked but don't have as much evidence behind them. And that was influenced by the stories and along with other stories too that I just told. So yeah, I'm going to finish up my look and then come back and do my outro. All right guys, this is the finished look. I hope you like it. I enjoyed filming this video and I always enjoy telling my story because it's not a very common one. And also you just don't see a lot of insight as to what goes on in medical school, especially during you know what. Please let me know what you guys think of any of the stories that I told down below in the comments. And I will see you next video. Bye!